What's up guys, Shea Panda here. Just playing uh, some farming simulator and watching a video on the case against the sexual revolution. But I'm um, just gonna sit here, play, watch, uh, you enjoy. The argument is that marriage is an oppressive tool, which I say, Yes, it is. When motherhood became a biological choice for women, fatherhood became a social choice for men. It became socially acceptable for men to walk away from children in a way that it hadn't been before. Those high status men are able to really, really set the terms. If a woman doesn't, say, have sex on the first date, it's easy enough to find another woman who will. So you end up with a slightly artificial level of competition between women who, you know, there are actually enough men to go around, but there aren't enough men that they actually want to be with to go around. Exactly. And so they're competing for a minority of men who basically exactly. have you know, it's kind of open season. They can demand that their own preferences be met. Louise Perry, it's very nice to meet you. And you, what a pleasure to be here. Yeah, this should be good. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to come on. I'm excited for this conversation. Before we get started, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? I am a, a British journalist based in London and a campaigner and I, the director of a think tank called The Other Half, which maybe we're going to talk about, which is um, we promote what we call common sense feminism. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm an author of a new book called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. Case Against the Sexual Revolution. Okay, this should be good. How much negativity do you get online? Less than you'd think. Good. I thought, yeah, I thought that I'd get loads, but actually, I would say 90% positive. Well, you have a very nice, soft voice, too. I Maybe that's what like, it is, yeah. People can't get mad at you. <laughs> too mad at you. Oh, that's nice. I think it might be the English accent as well. Yeah, that's <laughs> sneaky. That makes people sound smarter, too. It's kind of like a Even. cheat code in life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This should be good. So what's your book? What's your book about? And what is common sense feminism? Let's start with what is common sense feminism, actually? I mean, partly it's a nice phrase that sort of confuses people. Ditto calling a book something like The Case Against the Social Revolution. It's a, bit, it's a bit confounding, isn't it? What we're trying to do with the other half, the reason we called it the other half is because it's not only about talking about women, you know, the other half of the human race. It's also about talking about the other half of life. Because my view that I put forward in the book is that what the feminist project has been, at least in the second half of the 20th century until now, has been about encouraging women to be more like men mm -hmm. in every possible way. So to this imitate true. sexuality. To it's very strange. The male sphere, it's like raising imitate what it is to be a man above, in terms of things like you know, a woman. Prioritizing professional success over everything else. All this sort so of it's stuff. just like, yeah, exactly. And I think it is very clear. And it's <laughs> like all the metrics that men use to measure their success. And that actually most women do not see that as their aspiration in life. Hmm. Most women want to either prioritize family life or to, or to balance it yeah. against career. Most women want to spend more time with their children, not less. <laughs> most women want to um, aspire to stable and meaningful monogamous relationships rather than um, have sex like a man, um, as Sex and the City described it. And um, this is extremely obvious from polling. You ask. British women and indeed American women, all of these questions, and, and it's a fairly, there's a fairly resounding majority, but that isn't what you hear represented in Westminster or indeed in Washington, because there's a really big gap between what most feminist lobbying organizations, or advocacy organizations of all kinds, and, and, and also in the media, but what? tend to represent as what we want. in the tree, it disappeared. Do actually want. So the, the project that we've set ourselves is to try and represent majority female opinion in the corridors of power. Wow, okay. Are you making any progress? It's very early days, but yes, I would say yes. Good, good. Um, do you know the background of why the sexual revolution kind of pushed women towards acting more like men? That's an interesting question. I think it's probably partly got to do with the women who... So this is my opinion. The women's movement was hijacked by corporations and the one percent and the goal was to get women to desire to enter the workforce which they have why would they want that because it doubles 
the labor pool that they can pull from, which means when you go out for a job as a man, you've got twice the number of people that you're competing against for that position, which means they can be more aggressive with uh, make make lower pay offers. Um, that's just my hot take on it. He, he formed the second wave. And it worked. Um, I think that the... Have salaries the gone up? feminist no. culture of the 1970s, um, which was really focused in places like Greenwich Village in New York and a handful of other urban centers. And the women who, right, who, who wrote the most out. important texts of the second wave and went on to found organizations like now tended to, to be super, super well-educated super intelligent, super disagreeable, particularly disinclined towards things like family life, you know, the whole, the whole, from their, po from their point of view, they were really spurred on by a desire to reject the traditional feminine role and often did so in quite spectacular ways, you know, on a personal level. Some of the biographies of Second Wave is really, um, really unusual, really interesting. And so they obviously had preferences that are different from average female preferences which isn't to say that everything that they campaigned for was so kind of misaligned with what is good for most women, you know, things like setting up domestic violence shelters what or setting wrong with rape, this rape crisis centers. My first job working at a university was, um, was working in a rape crisis center. Those are the kind of institutions Ooh. born from the second wave, which are, you know, like really good. I don't think anyone, I, I think very few, even anti-feminists would argue against the establishment of those, those kind of institutions. But I think they were also just generally geared towards aspiring to a more masculine way of living, just on the basis of self-selection and, and, and personality Ugh. than most women. That would be my guess as to why the uh, priorities just kind of tended in that direction. This fucking thing. That's interesting. That totally makes sense too. A bunch of disagreeable. Oh, thank gosh, it's light enough. Smart women pushed society yeah. in a direction that doesn't represent the average woman. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Although I'd also say that I think that the Feminist thinking has been important and has and has um, shaped our recent history in all sorts of important ways, but it it all comes secondary to material changes. This is getting hard with all these you stumps. Know, the I think it was Phyllis Schlafly who first said that the washing machine did more to liberate women than did feminist campaigning. I think this is just so. This is evidently true. Right, and there are so many ways in which our lives have dramatically changed within the last hundred years. Not just the washing machine, but the pill, which is really forms the yeah. the centre of my my book. The fact that we now are orientated much toward much more towards a knowledge and service based economy, which de-emphasises manual manual work and, and physical strength, which of course men have more of. Um, I think all of these things have have pushed women out of the domestic sphere and into a more m more masculine roles. Um, you know, it is good for GDP, to put it bluntly, to, to have women participating in the workforce. And when you have things like washing machines and central heating and microwaves and all these things which mean that the work of running a household just takes less time, it becomes more possible to, for women to do things like that. And when you can also delay childbearing through the pill and other contraception, women being more like men becomes possible and becomes actually economically productive. The problem is that there are all sorts of costs down the line from that, and actually including economic costs down the line from that, which mean that we're dealing with some quite painful trade-offs. This episode is sponsored by NordVPN. If you followed the show for a while, then you've probably heard me complain about how bad Canadian Netflix is. It was bad as a teenager. It was, it was annoying to go to America and see how good Netflix was. If you Americans don't know, it's bad. I mean, Netflix has been bad recently in America too, I suppose, but at least it has variety here. I used NordVPN to watch the best shows on Netflix and online anywhere in the world from Canada. Now that I live in Miami, I don't use NordVPN to watch good Netflix shows. But no matter where I go, I like to safeguard my online activity. NordVPN's state-of-the-art encryption protects you from third parties who want to watch what you're doing online. It also protects so you from hackers about her. and malicious people who might want to track your online activity. With their incredibly fast coverage, some VPNs are so slow. NordVPN's a simple way to guarantee your privacy and keep you safe online. It's super easy to this start using. It protects you from anyone knowing what websites you've been visiting. Break. And I think given the political atmosphere right now, 
it's worth doing. Maybe it's just her. I, I haven't really watched her before. Knows? Grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash TMPP to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan plus four months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So you can go there, see how fast it is, forget you're using a VPN, be protected. Sign up for NordVPN and enjoy this episode. Okay, wow. Well, that I want to cover a bunch from what you just talked about. Uh, let's start with economic trade-offs. So what are the economic trade-offs for Where did it go? It just vanished. Those women in the workplace and <sighs> surround children. Because someone has to look oh, after the glad. children would be the first thing. So you have this slightly strange artifacts of the right. way that we I think these trees are um, too small. Measure GDP. Where if you have, um, if, a, if a mother goes to work and hires a nanny to do her role, what was her role while she's at work, um, that appears to be economic growth because you now have, in that unit, you have mother, father, nanny, all employed, as yeah. opposed to just having father employed. It's, it's a misleading... Falsifies your GDP. Though, because, the, you know, the work of... The domestic work that was previously unpaid is still being done. It's exactly the same work. It's just being done by someone else and for a wage. Um, and, of course, is, is... There's all sorts of sort of friction in that system that wouldn't be there otherwise because you've got three rotating parts that need to lock together, unlike in the single earner household where you just have the one and then you have someone... You have specialisation between mother and father. And you have mother specialising in the domestic work. Um, instead, when you imp- introduce the paid component, everything becomes much more complex, much more liable for collapse. So interestingly, it was um, Elizabeth Warren, of all people, <laughs> who wrote a book some decades ago, ago called The Two Income Trap. About the oh, fact yeah, that, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, when, you, when, when both parents are in, in paid employment, the household becomes dependent on both of them being in paid employment and there's much less room for slack. Whereas what you would yes. have previously is, is women kind of dipping in and out of the workforce, particularly working class women, dipping in and out of the workforce when, say, children are a bit older or when father's earnings have suffered and they need a bit of extra money. And female labor participation becomes a sort of a variable that can change over time depending on economic circumstances. Whereas if the family, all families, are dependent on two full-time incomes, there's no room for slack, there's no, there's no source of other income if, if, if hard times come along. And what's more, you all end up competing with... So the lump of labour fallacy, obviously, you know, it's not quite true that um, you end up with wages halved by women entering the workforce because women entering no. the workforce does grow the economy in all sorts of ways. Yeah. But there are certain products, like housing, for instance, if you have a fixed supply of housing in, say, a good school district... It does repress the pay, though. For, I 100% that, believe that. that. And everyone is competing with two incomes rather than one. It re- you, you and we can see that pay is repressed. I mean, there's all kinds of arguments as to why, but we can see that pay is not keeping up with inflation one extraordinarily high over the last high 40 years. So, so is, that, is that a result of women going back to work? or going to work in the first place, is that actually a direct result of that? Or did the housing, in the increase in housing prices come first? There are other things contributing to housing, housing prices, um, including... Gosh, these light the, trees the, the, really the hate The thing me. that is most often spoken about in um, political discourse on this is lack of building, which clearly is a factor. It's a factor as well in somewhere like the UK that you have this extreme concentration of high-earning jobs in London and in other, in other, part, other parts of the world. a little unrealistic to be able to lift a tree up by the end like this. So you expect, you know, house prices in San Francisco to rocket because Silicon Valley is based nearby. Um, <clears> there are other factors, but I think it is absolutely the case that joint mortgages, the fact that you now have, have two incomes competing mm. for, the same, for the same product of housing that everyone wants, has made it more difficult for people to live on single incomes. So... That's probably true. Uh, dual income is able to purchase. Dual income is able to place higher bids on the homes they want. But I also think that um, the mortgage market, the number of products in the mortgage mortgage market are so many more, so much more diverse. I mean, you've got like you can put three percent or five percent down on a house. You know, you can you have the adjustable rate mortgages where you're paying a low uh interest rate for the first five years and then it spikes um there's all kinds of different mortgage products and i think that also has a lot to do with the increase in home values 
if we got rid of mortgages, I was reading that if we got rid of mortgages, we would see, I think it was like t- homes go for 10% of their current value if there were no mortgages at all. It's because people would just not be able to, to afford a home without a mortgage unless they saved up and it would just take that long to save up before, you know, they were able to do it. So I think the mortgage industry has really hurt us simultaneously. Would we getting paid, be, be getting paid as much as we do today if there were no mortgages? So are, are we aggressively looking for more compensation because of how high home prices are? Anyway, just a thought. And look, there are advantages of women being in the workforce. I mean, I say this, look at me, I'm working. <laughs> there are advantages of women being in the workforce in all, all sorts of ways. Um, women having, you know, we mentioned domestic violence briefly. That if women have separate sources of, of income and want to escape an abusive marriage, that's clearly advantageous. The fact that women, I mean, women on average are as intelligent as men, have all sorts of skills that are actually really well suited to modern economy. The fact that women are more agreeable than men is actually great. In a, in a service economy, for instance, um, and increasingly, I'd say that office culture and all sorts of like, corporate culture is increasingly feminine. When call women more agreeable, I call them more really, open. Really flourish in that kind of an environment. So socially open. I, I, I think that the 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 idea that we can just sweep women out of public life and, and go back to the 1950s, which is of course an unusual decade. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think that's going to happen even if we want to victory. But but but, the, but these trade-offs exist. As with as with any complex historical change. Interesting. Okay. Um, you you spoke about the birth control pill. I'm very interested in that. I I know when I was young, I was put on the birth control when I was 14. I think for my skin, you know, because oh. you get and yeah. I I didn't stop taking it until I was 23. When I started reading about what the birth control does to your brain and the side effects it can cause and generally does cause. Yeah, That's what I've figured out since, right? Not good like for your depression, body from like every that. study I've uh, seen. Can you get into what, what you think the birth control has done to society? Is it interesting you talk about that? I mean, I don't really write in the book about the, pers- the personal side effects of birth control pill, but mm-hmm. so many women experience it. I'm just, I'm just uh, anecdotally, I know so many women who've said they, they came off the pill and their personalities completely changed. Yeah. And they realized how, because as you say, if you go on it as a teenager for acne, and then you're still on it for decades. You don't even know. You don't even know. Part. Also, if you're having a moody teenage phase, then and the moodiness never ends, then you don't identify the issues as the pill. It's extremely yeah. problematic, yeah. Especially yeah. if you've been taking it for so long, you don't even notice it's like a vitamin. Yeah. And it shouldn't surprise us, really, because we're, we're meddling with very, very yeah. important yeah. hormones, um, which have all sorts of flourishing effects that we should. We don't really understand. I mean, we don't... As a, as a species, we don't really understand our reproductive system at all. Yeah. Um, and all of the efforts to do things like growing babies outside of the womb or sex change or, you know, any of these sort of ambitious scientific projects, they're going nowhere. Like, let's be real. <laughs> yeah, it is yeah. so much more complex than anyone can, can actually grasp. I think we're a long way away from being able to do that kind of radical, radical yeah, transformation, sure. even, if we, even if we'd want to. I think the idea of growing, I personally find it incredibly dystopian, the idea of growing babies outside of oh and you have it's so narcissistic too it's like oh we'll, we're smart <laughs> enough to figure this out like that's yeah. that's just a narcissistic way yes. of thinking i think imagine a, imagine a new boy oh, never heard his way, mother's heartbeat i just find that i oh, guess that's another way to look yeah, at it you with yeah. your like english accent too it's <laughs> like worse that, <laughs> that description's it. worse yeah oh, it's so sad um, yeah um, so the pill, yeah, I mean, so in terms of the, the social consequences of it, I don't think that we should be surprised that for the first time in the history of the world, reliably separating sex from reproduction has had some pretty massive effects, and that those effects have been uh, both positive and negative and, and, and vast, right? And the thing that you notice happening across, if you, if, you know, you look at the, the, the social effects in, in the decade or two immediately following the introduction of the pill, remembering that it came in two waves. So initially the pill was made available to married women only, and then it was made available to unmarried women as well. Wow. And then not long afterwards you have, I mean, the, the, the timeline in Britain and America and other um, Western nations is all about the same. Not long afterwards you then get the decriminalization of abortion. And then not long afterwards, you see the, the shotgun marriage 
um, as, a, as an institution. Like you, see, you see marriage rates of all kinds falling off a cliff, but you also see the shotgun marriage, which had existed to deal with unwanted childbearing, disappears as a social tool. And the, the, the really perverse outcome of the pill, which is a beautiful example of the fact that human beings are very, very complicated and our societies are very complicated. You, you can't predict how technology shocks are going to affect them. You see um, rates of single motherhood rise. Who would have thought that would happen, right? You, you introduce a technology which allows women to regulate their fertility and it leads to a rise in single motherhood. But I think the reason for that I is really hate this harvester. the pill isn't 100% effective. It's not no a harvester. But it's and actually the early pill in cutter. particular, you've got quite a high rate of uh, quite a high failure rate but you end up with the absolute amount of premarital sex goes up and therefore some portion of that is going to result in an unwanted pregnancy and, and and some women for whatever reason don't want to have an abortion and so you'll end up with unexpected babies and when the social institutions that used to exist to regulate fertility like marriage have all fallen away as a result of the pill's introduction. That's, I mean, the, the, the phrase I use in the book, which isn't original to me, I can't remember who, who first said it, but when motherhood became a biological choice for women, fatherhood became a social choice for men. And it became socially, it became socially acceptable for men to walk away from children um, in a way that it hadn't been before. You know, women talk Not about that my body, my choice. Cases well, of scoundrels men don't have a choice in that matter. Women men, men have very few choices. Leaving. But it is now. I mean, think about think about if the draft is ever instated. In it's, if the draft's not go gone away, and is really in a way it's still there. It's just not activated. The sexual revolution because there's but, now no. You know, there's my body, no, my I mean, choice. The, well, the, the rates of non-payment men have to go into the draft where women do not. I don't see women fighting for the right to be drafted. You say who would? Well, I also don't see them fighting for men to not be drafted. And say that actually marriage is very uh, of but it was very egotistical i'll say that doesn't surprise me at all but Modern. that's but that but that has probably been the most controversial chapter for feminist readers really yeah oh, well yeah. yeah i suppose if you don't think about it then it would be yeah. difficult to wrap your head around i suppose the the argument is that marriage is an oppressive tool mm -hmm. um which i say Yes, it is. For men. <laughs> or maybe repressive would be a better way of phrasing it. And the, the whole point of it as an institution. I mean, what does marriage do for a woman? You make a promise. You know? And you're obliged to. She locks in a man. And that means that you're free to required to take care of the children. Once you've entered into that kind of institution. But that applies just as much to men as it does to women. The purpose of the institution is that it is controlling. But the principle being, once you've established this unit, legally bound together, socially bound together, spiritually bound together, if you, if you understand in a religious sense, then that is the basis from which you can form family. So it's a kind of, it is, yes, it's a means of, of control and repression, but it's one that permits your life to begin as a family. And, also, and means, you know, in extremis, that the nature of sexual asymmetry, which despite all of recent efforts by the trans movement and so on isn't going What's away. Going on? Right? Men and women are profoundly different on a cellular level. I, was, I find it really interesting that the campaign to deny the existence of biological differences between men and women has arisen at exactly the same time and become perversely successful at exactly the same time that actually we're understanding more and more about how profoundly we do differ. Ooh, let's get into that. Okay. <laughs> how, how, how do women and men differ? Is it on a cellular level? Yeah, so, I, so in the obvious ways, women are the ones who get pregnant, men are not. We are smaller and weaker than men, particularly on, in terms of upper body strength. So the, the force that a woman can apply through a punch is about half as much this one. as a man, um, which is a lot, right? And this is why you see in, um, in elite athletics, the difference between men and female athletes is, is huge. <gasps> I do wonder whether the, what? the, the, the people, the, the progressors who are me. most in denial about the differences between men and women. They pulled that away? I, I cannot help but suspect oh, that they don't do a lot man. of sports. Because I oh, think yeah, that yeah. if you participate, particularly yeah. in strength-based sports, or like martial arts or anything like that, you're, you're going to, it's going to become immediately apparent <laughs> men and women are profoundly different in this dimension. They're just hanging out with all the like spindly artist types. I see, yeah, very indoorsy. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> um, 
So there's those who thought to be obvious for everyone, but there are also all sorts of really interesting ways like women's immune systems go. As we saw with the COVID, no one more likely to die from COVID, and it was partly to do with things like men, um, certain lifestyle factors that might make a difference, but it was also just to do with our immune systems and the fact that I don't we have, lose to that. have immune systems which are um, These small little branches can really mess things up. The presence of an alien being and you know through pregnancy, so it, it has to be different. Women are more prone, therefore, to having autoimmune diseases, um, and um, much more. more yeah, more prone to things like, well, I don't know, osteoporosis. I mean, a host of things where you see massive, massive sex differences. Um, there's increasingly moves towards, in, in, in pharmaceuticals, moves towards creating drugs that are actually have different formulations for men and for women because of the recognition that actually our, our systems are so profoundly different that it, it's not... We... This, this touches on something. I think that the medical industry not only needs to focus on the difference between men and women but the difference between races like how each race individually you know had their evolutionary paths you know because it's it's very interesting that like what seems to work for one group of people doesn't seem to work for another you know and then sub haplogroups so haplogroups being uh the how we measure you know the path of our our uh our migration as people but yeah i that's definitely important difference between how men and women handle stuff but also uh, i think even at a race, women to racial level men, we should which is normally what uh, you understand do it in dosing. you have to because i think we were doing a great injustice actually having some really fundamental to uh, a lot of groups mean that our drug interactions are, are, are different by not and yes this is happening things. exactly at the same time that you have this like political discussion around whether or not women even exist <laughs> as a category we're not or not just sort of gender goo did you see the clip going around of it was somebody suggesting that the heartbeat at six weeks was manufactured by the patriarchy uh, I, 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 yeah i think i saw a little bit of that american politician is that right yeah that's where um. we're at <laughs> this episode of the podcast was sponsored by paleo valley beef sticks if you want to lose weight and be hotter eat beef sticks instead of eating junk it's an easy switch, and they honestly taste better than junk anyway. And they fill you up, but they don't make you want to keep eating. That they was a much better sticks. ad plug than Everyone the VPN one. Beef sticks. People who say or they VPN don't like one beef sticks really are lying. Bad. Paleo Valley is my go-to company for my kid for beef sticks. Paleo Valley's beef sticks, I've said beef sticks a lot, are made from 100% grass-fed and finished beef. Not only are the cows grass-fed, but the spices they use to flavor their beef sticks are also 100% organic and it's all produced right here in the USA. Paleo Valley also puts their beef sticks through a natural fermentation process, which helps feed your microbiome. So these are the most gut-friendly beef sticks on the market, and the snack you can eat that'll fill you up, won't make you crash, and is healthy. Head over to paleovalley.com to check out their beef sticks today. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com for 100% grass-fed beef sticks. Enjoy the rest of this episode. Yeah, I mean, that whether or not we want it to, sexual asymmetry is not going anywhere. And there has been such a reluctance among most feminists to grapple with it, particularly, I think, I'd say particularly now, but it's a long-standing issue when it comes to the psychological differences between men and women, the differences above the neck. We, some feminists, you know, radical feminists in particular, can, are, are completely au okay with the differences below the neck. Um, and will recognise the importance of things like strength differences. But the, but the fact that there are average oh, differences, well, on. very apparent ones at the population level, there we is, go. is more difficult if what you're aspiring <sighs> to is equality. And as you said, this, as I said at the top, this is you, your interpretation of equality is women being more like men. Absolute the fact worst. that there are these psychological differences is, that affect our, our behaviour and our preferences is, is quite difficult to reconcile. So things like women are more agreeable than men are on average, women are more neurotic than men are on average. And the fact that our sexuality difference, differences are very obvious at a population level. Yes, there are exceptions, but in general, men have more unrestricted sociosexuality. They're more interested in having casual sex, in watching porn, in buying sex. Um, men are much more likely to have paraphilias or fetishes. This is another interesting thing. I was reading a study where... Um they were measuring the 
the, uh, the, the bonding, the human bonding um, chemical that is released by the body. So men release a chemical um, when talking to friends and they called it the bonding chemical. They wanted to study it in women. They studied it in women. They found men release the body, the bonding chemical when they are talking with someone. But when they're having sex, they're not really releasing it. Women release the bonding chemical when they're having sex. But when they're talking, they're not really releasing it. Now, the reason that's interesting to me is because women are kind of known for, for wanting to talk a lot and have conversation and all that stuff. So it's kind of interesting that women have this... this I don't know what you want to call it, this, this uh, lean toward talking. And men are known for wanting to have sex. So men lean, have this leaning toward having sex. And at the same time, men bond from talking and women bond from sex. It's almost like the two sexes, um, it, it's, it's so complimentary that the men want to have sex, the women bond from sex, the women want to talk, the men bond from talking. So I just thought I'd mention that. Women are much more likely, with, with, with a few notable and interesting exceptions. So for instance, women are more likely to be masochists and, and so on. But in, in all other paraphilias, men are wildly in the lead. And I, these are all things that have become much more socially acceptable post-sexual revolution. All preferences that are much more likely to be found in men than they are in women. And oh, that was, that was like painful. That was another painful one. Casual sex. Oh, that was a painful one. Not right. only are men more likely to be interested in these things, but they also depend on women in order to enjoy them, <laughs> right? Which therefore places demands on women. I think that what, what we're basically seeing for sexual revolution is if you, can, if, you, if you understand two bell curves for men and women on the social sexuality scale, you know, it's not a conspiracy. This isn't to do with, um, with some with some exceptions. This isn't generally to do with men putting sort of interpersonal pressure on women. It's got it's got more to do with culture and a new incentive structure post pill. But you, you, what you're basically seeing is women's the bell curve sort of trying to be dragged upwards towards the the male end, and and women being encouraged to behave more like men in every possible way. Um, and I think in a lot of cases, it's making women miserable. Which is why I wrote the book. Yeah. It's making a lot of money. <laughs> I agree. Too. Those streamer yeah, girls that are getting all the attention from the guys, from they, they don't really seem happy. Sexual culture are very high status men. What about very disagreeable, intelligent women? I'd say in the workplace, absolutely. In terms of sexuality, I mean, there are women who are very high or very, have un, very unrestricted sociosexuality, I should say properly, are genuinely do enjoy casual sex, genuinely do want to watch porn, genuinely are interested in all kinds of sexual adventure and experimentation. Those women do absolutely exist, but they are rare. Yeah. And they will always suffer from the risks associated with casual sex, like the risk of unwanted pregnancy, the fact that uh, women being smaller and weaker means that in any encounter between a man and a woman on their own, a woman is almost always going to be much more physically at risk of violence. You know, most women can kill, most most men can kill most women with their bare hands, and but not vice versa. So even a woman who genuinely really loves casual sex, genuinely is really really driven to have as many partners as possible, uh, aside from any cultural pressure put on her, she's always going to run any run a risk in any mm. encounter. And I think you have to really want to have casual sex for that risk to outweigh the benefit to you. So yes, there are women who are exceptions to this. There are also men who are exceptions to this. And I think it's yeah, worth emphasizing sure. that male sexuality is quite, is quite, is quite flexible. Um, not in terms of sexual orientation. There's an interesting difference between the sexes that women are much more, bisex more likely to be bisexual than men are. Um, you know, 97% of men are straight. Um, but they are flexible in terms of their short-term versus long-term strategy. So there are circumstances in which it's, it's um, adaptive for men to want to have casual sex and to, you know, in theory, men can um, conceive a child every time they, have, they orgasm, which is obviously not true for women because we have much greater physical input into, into reproduction. Um, so you can see why women would have evolved to be much more cheesy about their mates mm -hmm. and much more careful about having sex than our men. Um, and there is, a, I describe it in the book as CAD mode. There's a, you know, CAD mode for men 
um, is being driven towards having as much, being as promiscuous as you possibly can get away with, you know. But the other mode for, for men, which I call dad mode, is orientated towards finding a wife, having children, investing in those children, investing in that unit, stability, you know, like th there is, and there's a there's an element of personal preference Objects for some men which is more likely to be drawn towards one mode or the other. But there's also an incentive factor and a yeah. culture factor that if it's advantageous in that moment for you to do one or the other, and if your culture is telling you to do one or the other, then that's going to drag men, you know, in one or other direction. And I think what we 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 see post sexual revolution in our sexual culture is um, the incentives are all towards pad mode. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think a lot of that's how you're raised as well and mm. who your friends are. And mm. I think for me growing up, I went to an art school in high school. So I was in a, I was in a very liberal crowd. I didn't mm. even know like what a conservative person was until like, 2016, really. Like I didn't know any conservatives. Mm -hmm. um, and dad, there was definitely a stigma around getting married, settling down, even dating somebody for a long period of time. It was pretty intense. It was very difficult to find somebody who's interested in being married eventually. It did happen. Like I did know have some friends that were like, oh no, I'm, I want to find somebody and settle down. And I think that was because of how they were raised is mm. there was a big emphasis put on that's the right way to live. And for families that had a more difficult time or were somewhat broken, then there was less emphasis put on that. And then those are the people who still aren't married and are still kind of screwed well, around families like that are broken too, they might even be uh jaded also, about marriage probably get into not that risky for a man but very difficult if they're dating a 32 year old woman who wants to have kids oh is she 32 yeah because she it's going back 32. to the limits of medical that technology right oh, we, we we do have things like ivf and surrogacy um, she looks young for 32. Supposedly I'll give you that. extends Jeez. biological clock. But the failure rate of IVF is pretty amazing, particularly when it comes to age-related infertility. For other causes of infertility, IVF is quite good. But for age-related infertility, it's honestly close to being a scam. Is that when you harvest eggs late? So I think that the age of the eggs does matter. Um, quite a lot, so if you harvest them early and then do IVF later. Um, but even then, do you remember there was that um, woman who appeared on the cover of Time because she was she was one of the early people to, to invest in egg freezing and she did it because she was in a very high power job, I think in New York, and um, it was advantageous career-wise for her to delay childbearing. And so she was she was this kind of glamorous shot on the cover of Time magazine and, 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 and her promoting this, this route to liberation for women. And then some years later, she went to harvest, she went to actually use the eggs and discovered that almost all of them had been destroyed in the process. Hmm. It was just devastating. Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's by no means a guarantee. And I've got to say, when you see um, employers offering things like air freezing to their young female employees this is increasingly a perk of jobs in certain in certain places particularly say silicon valley um or offering offering surrogacy services or it's a scam um, honestly they are doing it because it's in their the employer doesn't want you taking yeah, your your paternity time they, they usually they have to pay it in a lot of states it, now they have to pay it it's a very very risky route and they're not allowed to fire you in terms of your, your chances they, yeah they they want you to put that off as long as possible but it is keep being a cog in the, in the a crucial moment machine, you know in your professional life maps on exactly to your your fertility window that's another benefit for them which is actually quite quite short for and corporate it america has proved very difficult to, to to expand it it's a funny thing that we can we can keep people alive for a long time, and until recently, life expectancy just ticked, ticked up and up. I mean, it's now it's now falling because of things like death and despair, but that's the great story of the 20th and 21st centuries. Life expectancy just goes up and up, but people, our fertility window doesn't, and our and if, if anything, all of our social systems are completely masked against it. You know, the healthiest time really to be having children is in your early 20s, 
And yet that's exactly when we've got everyone is in education. So I can't exit the vehicle or else it's going to stop. Right? If, you're not, if you're not married or in a relationship, like everything oh, is this completely is no good. Child this is no in good. social sense. In a, in a biological sense, it's perfect timing, but you know, that's, not, that's not the priority. Um, also things like we, we struggle to keep people healthy for a long time. So yes, you stay alive for a yeah. long time, but from say the age of 17, you're going to expect to have a lot of health problems to be to be so much less physically able than you once were. Normally, yeah. you're not really able to work, depending on what kind of work. This is an argument I got in with some guy in Europe talking about his national health care. I'm like, oh, great. Well, people health. live longer over here. Just, oh, good. The limits of medical how, technology. How happy are they? It seems to amaze me. So I've had a difficult time. I, I grew up in a, like, my dad was traditional, right? My mom stayed at home, so I had a stay-at-home mom. And I was always... I, I had this kind of a difficult time understanding what I was supposed to do because on one hand I was told getting a PhD was massively important, going to university was massively important, but also you should be a stay-at-home mom. And I can remember as a teenager like adding up the years and being like, okay, if it's yeah. easiest to have kids in your 20s, but I'm also supposed, supposed to get a PhD. And it wasn't even bachelor degrees, like that's for sure, but like PhD mm -hmm. is what you really want. Like, how do I do both? And I can remember just being like, I don't know if I can. Like, I don't know if I can do both unless, like, I don't know how I can do both. And then I had some health problems, which delayed schooling. And I was like, okay, well, now the years are completely off. I'm not going to get a PhD until oh, I'm like 31. Stupid thing. Then, it's so annoying. Like, how do you balance everything? I, I don't know how there? people use this. Um, and I think I had a difficult time understanding what the average female is like because I'm extremely disagreeable. And for my entire life, I thought everybody else was just like me. Like it wasn't until I was 24. I had I have no idea why this was because my dad being who he is, I knew people had personality differences, but I couldn't wrap my head around what those actually manifested like. Mm -hmm. So when I had conversations, uh, I couldn't understand why people acted differently in conversations than I did until I was like 24. I don't know if other people have that problem, but it took me a long time. And it was difficult for me to figure out what I should feel like. And so the conversation's interesting because I don't think I think like the average female because my disagreeableness is so high. Um, what do you think the average female looks like? What do you think Hibble. they want? <laughs> I'm super agreeable. So yeah, so we're, which I do think actually is a real factor in all this sexual culture stuff. So a question I get sometimes is why are women putting up with this? Why would women put up with a culture that is not geared towards their preferences? Like just anecdotally, uh, and also in, in, in media culture, whatever. Totally so being example. told, men, women who the man's game is the right game. Go along with situationships, so called, right? Or have um, have a sexual relationship. You want to be a CEO. That's the so most that important thing in the world. Um, which they desperately crave. No, that's and just kind of, uh, we'll it's kind of it. Do pornified sex acts that they don't enjoy, that they don't want to do, that they're trying to please this man, whatever. And, and the question is, why would women put up with this when, when in general, women are the more, are generally the, the sex with more choices when it comes to mates? Because we know from all the dating app uh, data, which has proved to be so useful for sex researchers, that um, the hypergamy instinct in women, the, the, the subconscious desire to to marry up and to um, be drawn towards higher status men than oneself, which men don't have. Men are quite happy to generally have relationships with women of the same or lower status than themselves, but women are not. Means that you end up with women kind of clustering towards the higher status men. I think the figures on Tinder is it's like 10% of men get 60% of likes, the top 10% of men that is, and then the bottom 90% are getting very little. Whereas women are generally get a lot of likes, but they're getting likes from men that they're not interested in. That's a lot of and likes. I think that What's going on is because you've lifted I'd like to know what a lot of likes the monogamy is. restriction. Not legally, you know, polygamy is still illegal, at least in the UK. Um, that is probably the next frontier. Yeah. The poly polyamorous are going to start clamoring to have their, their relationships recognized in law. But for now, it's still illegal. But in practice, because premarital and extramarital sex is now socially acceptable, um, these high status men who in previous era would have got married and would have removed themselves from a dating pool instead are able to have 
be um, serially monogamous or even able to have simultaneous relationships with, with women who don't, might not even realize you know they're, they're part of these harems right digital harems and um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's why those women and uh, those those high status men are able to really really set the terms because if they if, if a woman doesn't say have sex on the first date it's easy enough to find another woman who will so you end up with a slightly artificial level of competition between women who you know there are actually enough men to go around yeah this is another men that they actually want to be with this is another point i um i firmly believe women set the morality of uh, a country i say oh that's not fair why can't men do that yeah yeah oh men approach the women but the women ultimately decide in a first world country you know it's just okay so this guy is behaving poorly but you know what he makes a lot of money and he's handsome so you know i i'm going to accept <laughs> that so anyway just a thought and so they're competing for a minority of men who basically have i mean it's kind of open season they can demand that their own preferences be met so What's the what's the solution here <laughs> now that we're in this predicament? <laughs> I mean, on an individual level, it is quite possible for people to just choose to be a bit more trad. The, the, the challenge is, of course, finding a partner who wants who wants that, too. But I, I'm noticing around me a, a quite a significant turn against yeah. this stuff. It's increasingly common in elite circles as well. You know, there's this there's this apparent turn towards Catholicism among young people. New Yorkers and I see it among young Londoners as well, a greater conservatism among the sort of subsection of, of the elite. You can choose to, to do that, you know, you can still get married, you can still not have premarital sex, you can still choose to be a stay-at-home mum, have loads of children. I mean, it's more difficult because things like being a stay-at-home mum and, and, and in an economic environment... It's, I think it's nearly impossible to be a stay-at-home mum. It's just mom. harder than it used to be. Um, you won't have the social support that you used to have. Because mm -hmm. the, the, the entire economy um, is modeled around a two-income family, right? Like to get a house, two incomes. Extent. Like it's all but the whole economy is two-income. It's still possible. Families. So I do have advice. For Cars are priced for two-income families. All that along, stuff. Just, along those lines, you know, yeah. you, you, I think that one change that could come about quite easily is just. I think part of the I said, sorry, I was saying before that part of the reason why you see women putting up with nonsense is because of the hypergamy effect. But I think the other reason is to do with agreeableness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And agreeable people just find it really difficult to, to, to be assertive in those situations. And when, when, for instance, the norm becomes having sex on a first date, and indeed the norm becomes having sex before marriage per se, you know, it used to be that if the social expectation was that you, you wouldn't have sex before marriage, then there's no conversation. It is just assumed after a date that you know, we will not be having sex, that's the default. Now the default is to have sex. And that means that women are put in the situation, sometimes very agreeable women who are really keen to please these, you know, these, these desirable men, whatever. High they value have to men. Be defending their own sexual boundaries, even if they're actually quite reluctant. And off, it's often, often what you see in Me Too cases where women are describing situations where they're, they're, you know, they're with a man who potentially they are actually quite romantically interested in after a date, whatever. Aziz Ansari was the famous example. Do you remember that one? The, the actor Aziz Ansari, who had a date with a woman, um, went back to his place and she didn't want to have sex. He did. I'm going to say this. It is unfair. It's biology, but it's unfair biology that women, you know, a man can go through life pursuing his career and he can just continuously, you know, go after that CEO position, that, that c-suite position uh go after the money you know just all the way through he can go through his 20s doing this his 30s doing this he can reach into his 40s and he can be like you know what i think now i'm going to settle down and then he can settle down he can still have kids he can still have a family a woman she's trying to compete with him she's going through her 20s through her 30s she hits 40 and she's like i only got a couple years left to have a kid <laughs> it, it's just it's not biologically fair, but it also means women should ditch these guys. Like, the reason that guy was able to go through and muddle through life for 40 years is because 
women just gave it up to him. Yeah, you're going to disagree with me, but that, that's just my opinion. That, that women will give it up very easily to keep the man that she perceives as high value. But he's he's just screwing off. He's taking her on trips and stuff like that. And he's dumping her the next month for the next thing. Taking that one on trips. He's just going through life. He's focusing on 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 the next metric. That's what men focus on, metrics. So, anyway. Yeah. He didn't rape her. There wasn't anything illegal that happened. She never really said no. But she also wasn't was was a bit reluctant yeah. and, and made it she felt made it evident non verbally that she was reluctant. He apparently didn't think so. Um, and they ended up and they ended up having sex. And she felt felt really violated and felt really distressed. And she later she later wrote about this and it became a whole thing. She had to express what what happened in the terms of consent. And so the the, the conversation that happened afterwards was was this really consensual? What you know what was this sexual assault, etc. I think the answer was to consensual. That is no, it wasn't sexual assault in a, on a legal level, but it was All you need to do is good. say no. Yeah. And he didn't behave well and he didn't behave like a gentleman, right? He didn't sleep with him. Historically, he didn't behave like a gentleman. He didn't demonstrate chivalry. He put pressure on a woman who, what, who, who he ought Walk to away. was reluctant. But the thing is that when, when the expectation, particularly when you're talking about a fan, going on a date with a celebrity, which is the circumstances there, and they've gone back to his house, the expectation was that they would have sex. And so it was incumbent on her to be assertive mm -hmm. and to say no. And to not go even to the house in the first place. So I think yeah. that's, that's very often what's going on. And I think that if there's one change that could happen quite swiftly, potentially, is if we had a bit of a change in, in norms and expectations, and if women felt more confident in demanding certain things, they, I hear so often from young women, in particular, this, you know, I'm afraid of being frigid, I'm afraid of being crude, yeah. I'm afraid of, of, of being considered low status because I don't want to do X, Y, Z. If, if the status flipped and, and different expectations were in place, then I think you would see women, and therefore men, behaving quite differently because women, women are the gatekeepers, you know, most of the time. They what are. you see now, for instance, at the moment, is you see there's this dreadful phenomenon on TikTok of young women showing off their bruises that they've got from having rough sex with their boyfriends, like oh. really young women, teenagers. I so haven't heard of this. they've got bruises on their neck and they'll like, take TikToks off them, and this is, this is considered to be really desirable. I think all women will show off about how many partners they've had. I think that that's coming from a misunderstanding of male sexuality. I think that we, because we're we're all kind of collectively in denial about how profoundly different men and women are on the cellular level, as we were saying, but also psychologically. And I think that a lot of young women don't realize that men are much more geared towards having emotionless sex than they are. Yeah. And actually are much more willing to have sex yeah. with women. They really, they wouldn't care if they got hit by a bus next week, frankly. Mm. And so things like habit, you know, being able to, to, to entice a man into bed or, or, or stop have rough sex or whatever. Dating those guys. It's not actually much of an achievement. Stop looking for that validation. It's easy to do that, particularly as a, as a young woman. But because of that misunderstanding of the fact that men regard sex quite differently from women, I think that these, these young women don't know that because they've not learned it yet and because the culture completely misinforms them about reality. Um, I think that if they did know that, I don't think they'd be putting these videos on TikTok. Yeah. So that's I a kind agree. of modest aim <laughs> to let yeah, them know. No, it's a good, it's a good aim. Um, mm -hmm. I agree. I think that that's kind of similar to my misunderstanding of personality differences till mm -hmm. I was 24. Just not, I just didn't, I knew, but I didn't understand what that looked like. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that probably goes for differences between men and women too. I still have a hard time with that. Like e even with my husband and I am fully educated in the differences between men and women. And mm -hmm. I still have a hard time understanding why responses to situations can differ between us and it's because we're you know i i mean i have that issue with looking at other women as well but i, I think it's very hard for people to to understand how different men and women can be or people can be from each other it's tricky i i found that having a baby actually i mean i i like you i knew i knew these things academically i found that having a baby made them really really apparent um, the sense to the sense in which we are sort of slaves to our biology, and actually we don't we don't have nearly as much control over our, our instincts and our behaviours as we think, because 
the way in which maternal and paternal instincts differ, for instance, is really striking. And particularly during, so my son's 16 months old now. Mm. You know that instinct to check that your baby's breathing? Yeah. Which everyone does. I didn't know initially that that was a natural thing to do. And so you, you feel a bit crazy constantly going and checking, checking the baby's breathing. But then I, and I still do it occasionally, but when they're newborn, you do it all the time. I found out recently that apparently chimpanzee mothers do that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, isn't it? I didn't know that. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. That was kind of um, cool. And my husband doesn't do that. It's like rooted bit, in. But it's not the same. Our biologies. Kind of desperate drive towards cool. like I've got to check the baby's breathing, um, which all of my all of my mum friends have said they have as well. Um, these the things thing, are deep. The thing, yeah, yeah, they are. The thing yeah. that I noticed. So uh, the thing that I noticed when I had I have a five year old daughter. This was very strange, and I thought this was on a serious biological level. Is as soon as she was born, I couldn't sleep. Mm. I don't know. I don't know what your experience was, but I used to be able to sleep through anything, wherever, whenever. And then as soon as she was born, it was like she just breathed funny, right? Like mm. she's not crying. She'd be like, ah. just like this tiny little, and I'd be like, it'd be like an electric zap through yeah. my body, and I'd be awake. I was like, yeah, that's crazy. And she's five now, and it hasn't gone away. So I sleep mm. with like a mask and white noise. And if my husband moves, then I'm kind of awake. And mm. that wasn't the case before. And it happened mm. as That's soon as she was born. Did that happen to you? With noises? That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, um, it's exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. Um, so I don't know if this is true it. for other men, but for me, if there is a noise in the apartment, in the house, if there's any noise, I just have this urge to get up and f just check the house and make sure it's secure. So I don't know if that's a male thing or not, but them talking about that reminded me of this. As well that I, um, so initially we didn't co-sleep because I was so scared of all the Sid stuff and then ended up kind of gradually letting him stay in the bed. And one of the, and because I and I did that partly because I read about like the anthropology of infant sleep, and the fact that infants sleeping in the same beds as their mothers, crucially, not their fathers. So it's not safe to have fathers sleep with the infant. Yeah, because yeah, of the roll on them. To have mothers sleep with the infant as long as they're just how men are. <laughs> just present, rolling around. Like, <laughs> premature prematurity, or and mother has to not I be sleep on spread eagle in the bed or anything like that, but that in most circumstances it is safe to, for mothers to sleep with a baby um, because you are so attuned to them all the time. You're not going to roll over your baby. And actually what you end up doing yeah, roll is, over the baby. is forming a C-shape around <laughs> yeah, the baby yeah, where I you have that. like your arm. Yeah, and yeah. You, don't, you do it in your sleep. You don't even arm. know completely. Yeah. And that yeah. is apparently the natural thing, the C-shape. It's what they, 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 they write about in, um, in infant sleep studies. Like yeah. this? Well, or like on your arm, you know, and then yeah, your legs, yeah. like, like a little. Oh, that's so cool. Mask. Okay, I did that. Yeah. Um, wow. And uh, yeah, that's just that's because because your body is like completely set on this. I found as well when I in the early in the early weeks in particular, I'd like I would I would only ever dream about my son. I didn't dream about anything else. And I would if I closed my eyes, I could see his face. Like I had that level of constant attunement towards the baby, which then gradually lapses. Yeah, time, yeah, and that that link becomes a little bit less, you know. But you know, they talk about the fourth trimester. Yeah, we, we we give birth to our babies too early, really, and so you, you have to have this intense dependency initially. Um, yeah, it's which crazy. is a which has all sorts of social effects, obviously, as well, because it just is a very uncomfortable. If 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 you're a liberal individualist and you're no, I think that's all pretty about full. I better having autonomy, take and motherhood that truck is a, is a huge problem. Yeah. Strap it down. Can't be autonomous. And there's this really, you know, you, you're not really talking about two individuals when you talk about a mother and a baby, because the baby definitely can't be considered in that way because because he or she is just completely dependent on on other people for staying alive. But mothers also are so emotionally drawn towards their baby. Even if you've got formula, even if you've got daycare, even if you've got all these things which can kind of um, physically lessen the dependency that mm -hmm. emotional work is insane and you know mm -hmm. try as you might trying to persuade mothers to to break it if that's your social project you're gonna fail that's also cruel it yeah. would have been so much easier like i had scarlet yeah she's five so i had a five years ago and 
it really decimated my social life. Like, and I was prepared for that, mm. but it would have been so much, like there's a reason women, most women aren't doing that, mm. right? Especially if you're in a more liberal circle, because you have a kid and you're 25 or like 24, 23, you even 26. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like, okay. I was 29 and no I felt really rest. young. Yeah. I know, 29 yeah. even, Yeah. right? Like. And then you're the only person, especially if you're like, probably if you're educated or if you're more liberal, you're the only yeah. person in your friend group that has a kid. Yeah. I had responses from friends that are like, oh, you're ruining your life. And mm -hmm. like that was, and then the neighborhood I moved into at the time too, I was looked down on. Like I had a kid mm -hmm. and they're like, well, what's your job? It was these older women too. These like 56 year old women were just, jealous. Oh, you're just staying jealous at home. older women. Gosh. Okay. Yeah. And I was like, wow, wow. So now my entire social circle is broken. My neighborhood, everyone in my neighborhood is 15 years older than me with the yeah. kids that are the same age. It was just like, I have the same. good yeah. luck with that. And it's worth it for sure. It's worth it. And I think, um, trying to, like, I appreciate what you're doing because what needs to happen, I think is it needs to be made cool again. Because women yeah. need it, right? It needs to be cool. It needs to be yeah, cool no, to be a gentleman. Great. It needs to be cool yeah. to be a dad. Like yeah. having, it's so attractive to have a man say, hey, I want you to have babies with me and I want to mm. take care of you. Like mm. that is so attractive. I don't know mm. when that stopped being attractive. I think it still is. It is, but it, like, it's just, yeah, <laughs> it's just persuading people. That I know, I know. I completely agree. And it, it, it also ends up with this slightly unfortunate that I found around here because we live in we live in London and we're in one of these parts of London where, yeah, like at my hospital, the average age for first baby was like late 30, the average age. Whoa. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. And that, is and that crazy. was including, Shoot. you know, where I where I gave birth covered an area with quite a high South Asian immigrant population where women were having babies a lot younger. So it was, it was that balanced with the, with the upper middle class women who were having them really late. And, um, and also most, most women go back to work quite quickly. So you find mm -hmm. quite soon that if you, um, if you want to be stay at home or if like me at the time I was, I was at home part of the week, um, you have no one to hang out with. I know it's, Everyone's it's rough. At work. And also it's you don't rough. have many friends who have children. So they're all at work, obviously, and their social schedule isn't going to fit in with you. You know, you want to be having like mid morning um, socializing. You can't be doing late nights and stuff. It's yeah, it's difficult breaking it's from. Sad. Yeah, you have to see, you have to seek out people who are also making your eccentric decisions. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully that'll become more and more common. It was so yeah. interesting. I, I spent a period of time in Serbia, and if you went out to like the, the streets or there. People the hell was that? Like little coffee shops. There were people my age that would have two or three kids with their mm. friends, mm. like t that would also have two or three kids. Mm -hmm. And the like men are drinking beer, women are drinking coffee or having a beer. Kids are like running around them. And they were 28 year olds. Mm -hmm. And they had kids yeah, yeah. from like a kid on their lap and then two kids that were under five. And I can remember looking at that and being like, they're having a good time. Like, that looks like fun. They haven't mm -hmm. lost their lives. They still have friends. They're out mm -hmm. socializing. I, like, I got to cheat in this game, guys. I'm so sorry. I'm so frustrated by this. I was like, this. that just doesn't exist here. And then when I was in, in Russia, they have restaurants set up so that you'll have a really nice like steakhouse restaurant. And at one area of the restaurant, they'll hire it's generally like kind of a grandmother type person that will you can give really? your kid to yeah, for crash. dinner. Yeah, nice. and they'll entertain your kid, and it's just part of oh, the restaurant. Or they'll yeah. have little rooms that are full of toys, so parents can go, and you can say, hey, you you know, here's a kid mm. for a few hours. The kids have a blast. Parents get a break. But society mm. is set up so that people can do that. Mm. And that institute, mm. like those types of institutions don't exist at all here. For Unless they're super deliberate. So I'm going on a, a weekend soon, which is put on by a by a conservative think tank and because they're very deliberately pro-family they are providing deliberately providing okay, childcare. Good. everything is family orientated you know but that's not normal that's so i initially thought oh, i can't possibly go because i don't you know and i spoke to them and they said no no this is genuinely pro-family they've made it yeah yeah but you have to kind of 
you have to go that extra mile. It was also something to be fair that a lot of um, feminists did, like doing conferences in the second wave times, doing conferences and providing crushes because you know if if children that can't participate, then mothers yeah. can't participate because they they come as a package. Um, I think also this thing of um, the fact that we don't really see kids running around in restaurants and stuff. I think it's also because that feeling of social disapproval. I think we've never had a time, probably in human history, where so many adults have no, have no experience with children. Mm -hmm. Because you mm -hmm. can now make it a really long time and never have held a baby. Because you're, you're not likely to have a lot of siblings who are having kids and not likely, to, all of your friends are also delaying childbearing. You're not really seeing kids out and about. You can, you can reach the age of 40 or something and you've basically never been in charge of a child. I mean, I used to work as a nanny when yeah, I was younger, too. so I'm unusual in that sense. Um, but I, I, it's kind of no wonder that you have people sort of whinging about children on aeroplanes and women yeah. and children in restaurants, all this stuff. Like, children are members of society too. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to obviously complain about parents. Remember, you're, to, you're a kid too, and you're yeah. probably more annoyed children than that kid on children, the plane. You know, like, they, they, they behave differently from Everybody growing. thinks I was an angel as and a you, child. You, you, you kind of you have to learn. Remember, let's you be just honest. have to learn that from being around them. And I think that as a society, we're increasingly not familiar with what children are like which then makes it more difficult to, as a parent, to be bringing children into places like restaurants or, or churches. Think, mm. how, think how noisy churches must have been. I feel like I can, I can almost remember, um, and I'm 30, I feel like when I was a kid, the, the weddings I went to... She is 30, that's church, crazy. She does not look 30. A few times, but I remember every time I went to one of those events, a baby would cry and then someone would mm. get up and go outside with a baby. That was mm -hmm. just the norm at those events, and now it's not. Including a child. What is going on here? You come across these. I've oh, not yet constantly. been invited to a child-free wedding, but this is apparently a thing. No, I think that's the norm. Legit I think it's the norm. I think that also crazy. has to do with. It, it is crazy. I yeah. think it it has to do with how much people are spending on weddings as well. Yeah. So I like, can see I how you don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think as well, you know, is a consequence of, um, is a consequence of the fail because, <laughs> because, well, consequence, well, a consequence of the death of the marriage institution, which is downstream of the pill, because I think that now it is so easy to get divorced. There's so much less permanence in general attached to marriage that I think people don't feel as if it has much inherent meaning anymore, whereas you know, back in the day when you really couldn't get divorced, if you just show up to... Marriage is a liability for men. Just you two. And you know, the, you get married, you she's now entitled to half your stuff. Even if the day was pretty trivial. It doesn't matter, she was working. Spend any money on it. It's very rare that she was a larger breadwinner, Whereas now but she's you still entitled to half your stuff. So I, I mean, were you really splitting your bills 50-50 the entire time you're together? And making it into a massive event and having these kind of big societies. Fifty percent of the down payment which were not actually normal, um, for say our grandparents' generation. They wouldn't. Mm, almost, people didn't spend almost the, that, the, that almost kind messed of big reception. Big time. Really that was what people did in the upper classes. That wasn't the normal. Um, whereas now it's expected, and it ends up, of, of course, being another impediment to getting married because you, if you can't afford yeah. to have a, a big wedding, then you might delay it yeah. and not invite children, which are actually the whole point of, of marriage, <laughs> right? That's the, that's the original purpose of marriage is to provide a basis on which to the children. Yeah, um, a solid foundation to have the a family. Whereas now the connection is obvious. Yeah. It's seen as a sort of means of self-fulfillment, maybe uh, an accomplishment in that you found your, your forever person. It's not seen as a... Whoa, 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 what happened? Oh, Actually, my super strength better. is still I think, on. <laughs> I think I've seen... I think things are going to oh get Oh, my better. God. I, it felt like things were going to get worse in 2018, and I feel like things are getting better now. I think the popularity in some of these more traditional ideas mm. and the acceptance of them, there's... Uh, things have split more, but mm. I, I feel like there are more people talking about, hey, having a family is okay. Wanting to be a stay-at-home so. mom is okay. Kids are kids yeah. are great. Like I think it's more popular. I hope, and I think men are, yeah. are getting more interested in the idea as well. I think, yeah. or I could just be in a bubble. I, I think you're right. I think there's something happening. Someone said to me um, the other day that uh, if you read, if you read, if you had written this book ten years ago, it would have been a flop. But but this seems to be, for some reason, a moment where. I haven't had very much negative response actually. Oh, that's cool. Um, 
I gotta so fix what I positive, messed up with super so strength. So much bigger than I thought as well. I get uh, like I get emails several times a day from people who are saying, "Wow, this book has had such an impact on me." And I I sort of feel like I'm just saying obvious All stuff, right. but I think that we're living in a time where the obvious stuff needs to be said. Agreed. Okay, so where can people go to find your book, and where can people go online to find you? So, um, best place to find me is on Twitter. So I'm at Louise underscore M underscore Perry. And the book is called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, A New Guide to Sex in the 21st Century. And it came out uh, like two weeks ago. Sexual the Revolution was, it was great for men. All over the world. Yeah. And it's about to be translated into a bunch yeah, of Yeah, break those bonds, girl. That is so cool. Congratulations. Thank you so much. That was good. Are the credits rolling? No credits. That was interesting. All right, guys. I'm going to stop it there. Interesting, interesting discussion. Um, but I'll catch you next time. Thanks. <laughs>